Meine Damen und Herren, herzlich willkommen im Kunsthaus Bregenz. Ich freue mich sehr, dass Sie so zahlreich an diesem verregneten Morgen erschienen sind. Ich möchte mich bedanken, besonders bei unserem großartigen Gast. I want to say a warm welcome to you, Andre Sala. Thank you so much that you are joining to this morning. Thank you, Thomas. It's really a pleasure. Ich möchte mich auch bei allen bedanken, die diese Ausstellung ermöglicht haben, ähm, insbesondere bei Andri Salas Team, bei Dominique und Olivier und vielen anderen, die im Vorfeld da beteiligt werden, waren. Ich möchte mich bedanken bei dem Team des Kunsthauses natürlich, ähm, besonders bei Stefan Wagner, Lisa Hahn und äh, Max, die Unglaubliches geleistet haben, aber auch bei den Unternehmern, die beteiligt waren, Martin Beck und äh, vor allem Eidotech aus, aus Berlin. Aber es waren viele, viele andere Firmen äh, beteiligt, weil Sie sehen, es ist eine Ausstellung nicht nur mit künstlerischem, sondern auch technologischem Aufwand. Ähm, die Ausstellung hätte eigentlich schon vor einem Jahr stattfinden sollen, in Tandem zur Zeit der Bregenzer Festspiele im Sommer. Wir haben uns sehr schnell entschlossen, sozusagen sie dann ein Jahr hüpfen zu lassen und jetzt wurde sie realisiert. Manche von Ihnen kennen das Werk von Henri Sala, haben auch seine Arbeit auf der venezianischen Biennale 2009 gesehen, als er für Frankreich dort vertreten war, allerdings im Gebäude des Deutschen Pavillon. Damals hat man ausnahmsweise die beiden Gebäude geswitcht. Wir waren vor einem Jahr oder vor mehr als einem Jahr mit, dieser vor, mit der Vorbereitung der Ausstellung schon vor, voll, vollständig abgeschlossen, aber es sind zwei Arbeiten dazugekommen und bei beiden bin ich, ja, bin ich sehr stolz, dass sie hier zu sehen sind. Die eine im obersten Stock war ein Auftragswerk für eine unterirdische Zisterne in Houston, die Andri Sala im Winter, Herbst 2020 dort eingerichtet hat. Eine riesige Videoinstallation über eine Wasseroberfläche, aber gleichzeitig unterirdisch. Spiegelt ein wenig auch pandemische Erfahrung, aber nicht nur das. Und die andere Arbeit, die während diesem Jahr entwickelt wurde, ist die aus dem ähm, zweiten Obergeschoss in situ nur für das Kunsthaus gemacht, aus den Räumen des Kunsthauses heraus entwickelt, etwas ganz, ganz Außerordentliches und ich würde sagen, ein technologisches wie künstlerisches und ästhetisches Meisterstück. Ähm, da bin ich sehr, sehr dankbar und ich glaube, das macht die Unverwechselbarkeit von Kunst aus Bregenz aus, dass man solche Dinge wie diese, dieses Geschoss äh, realisieren kann. Das macht das, die Unverwechselbarkeit unseres Hauses aus. Sie werden... Es gibt so viele Referenzen, so viele Geschichten, so viele Eindrücke, so viele Empfindsamkeiten, die hier angesprochen werden. Ich kann das nicht alles erzählen, aber wir werden vielleicht einige Motive heraus. Sie werden wiederkehrende Motive finden. Sie werden Weg und Bewegung finden, Zeit, Tiere, Rotation, Drehung und nicht zuletzt die Idee der Wiederkehr selbst. Ähm, Andri hat zweimal so eine begriffliche Metapher dafür gefunden. Das eine war Déjà-vu und das andere war das Ritornell. Im Déjà-vu begegnen wir unserer eigenen aktuellen Erfahrung angereichert durch eine unerwartete Erinnerung. Und im Ritornell finden wir sozusagen den musikalischen Refrain, das Wiederkehren. Alle diese Motive finden Sie in den Arbeiten, aber das Wichtigste und Einfachste vielleicht ist überhaupt, dass, der Musik, dass die Musik der Protagonist wird. Sie sehen Videos, Sie sehen Filme, aber keine Schauspielerinnen und keine Schauspiele, sondern die Musik, die Instrumente, aber auch der Klang, der wird zum Akteur. Henri, maybe we're gonna start with the ground floor. Um, here we have a wall and then on this wall attached or mounted is some sort of music box. Maybe you can tell us the story behind it, or how you got into uh, the idea to create this piece. Well, I, um, this, this is part of the series of works called All of a Tremble, but there's a very first one which is not playing on a hand-drawn wallpaper, uh, covered wall, but it's on a, on a concrete wall, which is a direct inspiration, but also a response to this building, to, to, to its substance, to its concreteness. Um, 
therefore I want uh, I, I choose a, a vintage roller which is from the early 1900 but uh, this precisely this one is very modern one could say because it's so geometric it, it, it only has these lines which make the uh, when one anticipates that he's going to play a musical comp therefore a music one anticipates uh, that it's not only modern in it, visually but it's also modern in the sound that it can do because it can only play all the reads of the of the comp at once uh, and it's just one single tone that is um, yeah, it's, vibrating. It's, it's the multitude of a single tone because all the teeth, each of them, have a, have their own microtonal value, which is always gravitating around the A tone. So it's we are only here at the A tone, but the many it's very granular. It's all the dots, all the pixels around the the A tone, so to say. Um, a reason to 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 choose this a tone uh, from the others is also that uh, it seems to me that it's the the a tone or the la in in French or in Italian. It's it's uh, playing against this concrete wall. It's like a musical la playing against the la of this building because the concrete is the a tone of 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 this building. Basically, the fundament and also the concrete in both senses of the word meaning concrete as a substance, but also concrete as something which is solid. Absolutely, in both, in both uh, and in a way, as you say, fundament, because in, in music you have the fundamentals and the, and the overtones, so in a way, this sort of oscillating A tones, it's a little bit like the, the overtones to the, to the fundamental, which is the concrete. Uh, but basically, basically you, you translate also something what you can hear in something what uh, can be seen, because you have these lines. Um, Absolutely. Uh, 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 upon choosing th uh, this uh, this specific roller, which has been built back then to print wallpaper, to print uh, a pattern, to print uh, a motif, uh, it immediately ma made me think of uh, of of the way how one builds concrete walls when one would do it not like in a fantastic building like this, like a major public uh, work, but when how you do it in your own building. Basically, you use this stripes of wood or MDF that you put in parallel to each other and therefore there is always a little bit of the concrete that goes inside. The, the, and this is what produces these lines that also make you think of a pentagram, of a, of a musical uh, stave in a way. Um, and, and then uh, the idea was that as they come closer to the rower, they little by little they start moving, like oscillating, and then the closest they come to the rower, this is where they take completely the pattern of the, of the rower. Um, one aspect which is very important is once, once I choose about it, I, I, I worked with a friend, a musician, Augustin uh, Moore, uh, and so the, 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 the idea to come to these overtones of the la, the, re, the relation with, uh, uh, with the concrete, it was also very much uh, part of the conversations that, that we had together. Uh, and in this uh, space we have another series of work. Um, so it's diptychs, so it's table images, uh, and um, one shows a historic illustration of an animal, and the other is a drawing by you. Yeah, these, these diptychs, in a way, they are, they are uh, uh, about bending shapes, about bending uh, uh, anatomies. Uh, the, the, the vintage drawings, um, are somewhere between the 17th and the 18th century. It corresponds to the to the to the height of uh, the the exploration exploitation by the, the of the world by the Western civilization. And one of the ways to organize the new acquired knowledge was to depict all the new species that one encountered in the different continents or the new uh, lands. Uh, therefore, like in the in the 17th century, you have this prints and the frame was the page. Like there is the oldest of the of the of the drawings is the one which is next to California. There is not a frame there, but eventually, uh, over the next 50 or 80 years, a frame appeared, which was the, the frame of reference against which all the anatomies, all the species were compared to, to each other. Now, for many species, I realized that in order to fit that box, they, they, they were bent beyond their anatomical possibility. Uh, and I thought uh, just to, to fit to also this uh, uh, notion, to want to organize knowledge. And I thought it would be very, in, I mean, that's where the idea came, is what it would mean, what it would be 
to, to fit, to force to fit in a box another notion, which is another construct, but which is as much real and concrete, which is a, a geographical territory, a geological piece of uh, information, as well as a geopolitical notion. So in these drawings I, I, I put together, in these diptychs, like Italy, Chile, uh, California, combining both Northern California and Baja California, so both what is in US and, and what is in Mexico, uh, Cuba, uh, Japan, and somewhere upstairs, uh, uh, United Kingdom. And also upstairs is a very kind of, we would say in German, großes Kino, so a kind of a huge cinema situation, and then an Animal plays the, the main part as well, but also a very famous violinist. Yeah, I... Um the, during the, during the, the performance of the Elegy for Viola Solo of Stravinsky, there is a, a garden snail that is on its journey or strives to complete his journey from the beginning to the very end of, uh, of, the, of the viola bow. Uh, in a way, there is something, uh, when I speak of it, in this correlation of bending and in order to, 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 to manage, like bending in order to manage. Uh, this is what the garden snail does. Now, it's not a garden snail on top of a performance while a piece of music is being played because um, both the musician and the, the, and the snail, by its presence, by its pace and even its own weight, as small as it seems to us, it's not small for a musician who is so in such a balanced act of performing on two strings at the same time. So in a way he's inputting, he, is, uh, uh, he has a say in the outcome of, of this performance in many ways, not only in terms of uh, affecting the, the, the choreography of the musician, but also in a way of how, uh, because I wanted the elegy to be as long as the journey, uh, uh, Gérard Cosset, the, 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 the musician, the performer, we discussed together ways of how he would make the length of the, of the elegy be as long as the journey of the snail. And the elegy is usually six minutes, and here it's eight and a half minutes. Uh, uh, what he did, it, he did not just slow down the performance because that could have been musically gimmicky, but uh, this, this elegy of, uh, of Stravinsky, what is interesting and beautiful about it is that it's a monologue, it's an elegy, it's played by one musician, but it's constantly played on two strings. So there are two voices inside it. There's the upper and the lower voice. And what we did is that sometimes these two voices, they, they go out of sync with each other. So sometimes Gerard, would when he saw that the snail was not progressing, he would continue only with the upper voice. And then as soon as he saw that the snail is moving on, then he would go back to the second voice, to the lower voice and play the notes that had been left unplayed. So this bifurcation produced uh, 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 a longer uh, composition, not by means of stretching, but by, by means of bifurcation. And also waiting. There's some sort of time awareness. Yeah, I, 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 it's, it's understanding it's under, I, mean, in, in, in a, I mean, maybe it sounds too funny, but from the very beginning I thought of this film as a road movie, meaning what would be the shortest road movie? It's a road movie of 80 centimeters long or, some, or maybe shorter. Um, and also in terms of the format, which is a little bit, it's more like um, uh, the, the Western format. So it's a little bit like the idea of traveling, like of the pioneers, of going from one point to another point. So in that sense, there's this moments of waiting that, that that remind you many, or me at least, many of this, you know, this, the high noon moment in Western movies. When they're about to... And can you shortly explain how, how you did it actually uh, technically? Because how, how did you make the, the snail climbing up? Yeah, there are, I mean, there are different ways. I, I worked with a... With a um, uh, because one has to insist on the fact that it's, it's real. Yeah, yeah, There's no, no fake. It's, there is no, nothing fake in, in it. Uh, the, no computer generated image, no special effects. Uh, I worked with, uh, with uh, someone who is based in northern France, in Lille, in a university, and so he is somebody who is a researcher of, of, of snails and, and, and uh, the, the, that species uh, family. And while it's clear that snails are not like uh, uh, acting animals, it's not like in the cinema with a dog or with other animals, still there is an understanding by these people of, of how, this, uh, like, how, how they react to an environment. Um, 
So I worked with him. Uh, I knew that in order to make a snail go from A to B, there are different possibilities, and I went for, for the simplest, but also the most, the one that remains the most within the means of cinema, which is light. Basically, a snail would always want to go towards darkness, so the, the whole way how the, the film is uh, lit and the, the performance is lit is to, in the direction shooting up towards the, 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 the bow so that the snail would try to, to leave the light behind and go towards the, the darkness, which would be towards the end of the, of the bow. So this was the, 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 the way of how to, to conduct the snail uh, or the direction of the snail. Then, simpler said than done, because in the, in the way of how I wanted to film the film, like it starts a bit frontal and then it ends towards the, on a, like, 45 degrees further, of course the light had to move with that a little bit to make up for the movement of the camera. So there was a little bit more preparation into it. But basically it's the snail uh, would, uh, uh, would try to, to go towards the darkness, so we used the lightning of the scene as a way to push the snail forward. And if we move one floor further, there is this exceptional piece, uh, the site-specific one. Um, which is absolutely mesmerizing and fascinating. And uh, tell us how you did it. Well, the, the, um, it was inspired by, by this place. It's a very site-specific piece, uh, um, not only uh, both by what you see and what you hear. Um, the idea is very simple as an idea, and then of course it's a very long process of preparing uh, that, that I work with, with Dominique first in the studio, and, and, and it was very much completed here. Um, it's about taking photos of the space, like scanning that space, and then projecting the image of these walls back onto themselves. So when this, when the... Um, but then there are these moments when the focus of the, this projection goes in and out of focus. It goes between, shifts between blur and sharpness. And this is a musical score that does it, which is mostly musical sources coming from the top floor, as well as some coming from one floor under. So it's like a floor that's, that is like a, an encounter between two other floors, but also it's a, a floor that is an encounter between two floors where that bring us elsewhere. One in the environment of the snail and the elegy and the other one out in the outer space, in the environment of the International Space Station. So this is like the, the, the floor of interval uh, uh, between the two. Now when the... Um, uh, um, the the way how, how it sharpened goes out of focus produces also this landscaping sense because when it's, when it's sharp, the image which is projected, the walls become th themselves. They become even sharper than, than they are, so there's a moment of hyperrealism, so to say. And then there's, uh, there are the moments when the sound changes and then it goes unsharp and becomes much more distant. In, in a way, it feels like our, the, the, the place is becoming so distant that our eyes cannot adjust anymore. So in the beginning it feels like something, it's about our uh, anatomy, it's about our senses, it's not about the, 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 the walls themselves that are changing. And I think in the exhibition is also the most introverted floor because this is a, the moment that the first thing you see is what you don't see. Because you, you go upstairs and you expect to, to see something displayed and it takes a moment before you realize that there is something, but the first thing you realize is that you are there. As a, as a visitor, or me, uh, during the time that, I, that I've been working there. So that's, that's why I call it very introverted, because in a way, it, it, it folds you back into yourself and into your senses, particularly the, 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 the visual, the eyes, but as well as the, 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 the ears. I think it's very impressive, because it's this very old idea to, to bring an image as close to reality as possible. And on the other side, you know, to be aware of your own experiences, as you said, uh, be aware of, of senses, of sensitivities. And, um, and um, the building becomes a pulsating mm. entity, al almost a body. Mm. Uh, and yeah. the wall changes from solidness and substance into, into a skin which one could peel off. Mm. 
Yeah, it, the work is like a double skin, like a second skin to the to the to the space, like a drum skin. And, and that's where it's coming. Like uh, like you said the other day, it's it it reacts a little bit like a drum skin. It's so that there is something very percussive about that piece, uh, that floor. That's why in the the way how I conceived the the trajectory of the in the exhibition is that before we get to this floor, there is this suspended drum. Uh, in the in the staircase, so it already gives us a first uh, a first uh, sense of percussion and of and of skin and impact with the skin before we go into the 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 the, the, the larger space where, like you said, like the, the piece is like a second skin to the space. Maybe you can tell us the story about the drum. Yeah, the, 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 the drum is part of a series of, of works which I call doll drums. Uh, some of them are standing on the floor and other ones are, are suspending or, or in mid-air floating, uh, like, like this one. Uh, this one is, is both, it's painted very dark and it's burned, so the, 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 the wooden uh, body of the drum has been, has been uh, burned, as well as the drumsticks. Um, it's it's suspended and it's it's uh, uh, it's there is nothing mechanical about it. It's an acoustic piece. It's an instrument. That's also something that almost all the works in this in this show, besides the drawings and maybe the the, the, the floor we just discussed, there there is something in, in, instrument instrumental about them. Like they are both uh, a, a work with content, but they are also themselves. They act as instruments. Like the. The, if and only if X like an instrument, this is an instrument, the drum piece is an instrument. On the top floor, we'll find again an, uh, depicted an instrument that is playing. Um, but so to go back to, the, to, to Haunted in the Doldrums, um, it's an it's a instrument, but that's also a, a piece of, of, of self-censorship, because it's an instrument that leaves out from censoring itself, what is there? It's uh, uh, there are speakers inside which are which are playing uh, a voice that is uh, recounting 30 plus names, um, but you cannot hear these names because that's exactly what is uh, triggering the reaction of the drumsticks. Like the the the, the, the subwoofer, the speakers which are inside, they trigger the, the reaction of the drum skin, and the drum skin makes the the the, the drumsticks bounce back. So it's a reversed process in a, in a drum usually. The drumsticks play the drum and in this case is the drum that is playing the drumsticks. Um, therefore, because of the ratatat of the drumstick, one cannot hear what, are, what is this voice that is giving the energy to the drumsticks to, 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 to bounce back. It's 30 plus names of, uh, of people that we can't know otherwise uh, from, uh, from Tanzania, uh, people with uh, albinism. Uh, who very often uh, and increasingly so unfortunately they are they are hunted uh, because of the wrong belief that that uh, that uh, consuming or having or owning parts of their physical body uh, uh, could make one prosper be successful be rich uh, and therefore their lives are, are continuously in in, in, in danger and another the floor, the top floor, there's again the idea of like a, the drum seems from from a far angle, it seems like a, a bat suspended or also might be also an orbit or a satellite. Um, and this idea to go in, into outer space is uh, the central idea of the last piece on the top floor. Yeah, this is a um, this weather turntable that is floating and drifting in the in, in, inside one of the uh, of the spaces of the International Space Station, precisely the the the, the part called Destiny, which is uh, which was a, a later addition to the International Space Station uh, by the United States, and it's uh, it's the place from where one can take better photographs of the space, um, and. It looks like, I mean, there is no more human activity. There is nothing dramatic in what one sees, it, but it just looks like something is off, something is wrong, the fact not to see any human. And the only thing you see is all these multiple revolutions of a drifting uh, uh, turntable is zero gravity. Uh, it's a turntable techniques, uh, which was very common um, in, in, in the 70s and 80s. I'll come back to the choice of, of that. Uh, now it, we know it more as being one of the favorite tools of DJs, but back then it was a, a much cheaper, it was a household uh, 
device, like everybody would have that one. Um, uh, what it's playing, though, it's a piece of classic music uh, 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 from the Quartet for the End of Times of Olivier Messiaen, and precisely the third movement called The Abyss of the Birds. Um, it's uh, the Quartet for the End of Time, besides being a, uh, an amazing piece of music, is also very known to be the most, probably, not probably, but the most known piece of music uh, written in captivity. The uh, Messiaen, uh, uh, composed it when he was a prisoner of war in a German Stalag in nowadays Poland uh, shortly after the, the Blitzkrieg and it, when he composed this quartet in, in, by being, while being in the camp he did not compose it like usually thinking of instrument but thinking of people because he could only have it performed by the musicians he could find in the camp which were co-prisoners and, and friends of his um, this is a piece from from 41 from the early 40s but another element that inspired me in this work which closely relates to, to Houston where I showed first the piece is also the story of uh, Ronald McNair. Ron McNair was uh, uh, um, an accomplished mathematician, accomplished saxophone player and one of the uh, of the first uh, Afro-American astronauts uh, who were uh, in space. Um, he was to do the very first recording of a musical instrument in zero gravity, uh, professionally. Uh, uh, something which unfortunately did, did, not ha did not happen because the day, that, the day that he was to record this piece, it was uh, the, the, the day when he was a member of the crew of the Challenger. Uh, and as we know, uh, we know of the Challenger disaster. So in a way, the... The, 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 the recording never happened, it, it, it stayed as, an in, as a... As a, um, as a concept, as a, as a, intention? As an, uh, as an uh, intention. So for me, instead of when I was thinking, like being, uh, thinking of these two totally different stories in a way one could say, but they, they, they do share in common the sense of being captive, one being a captive in a, in, a, in a POW camp, but the other one being captive in a, in a device very far away from here, which is both uh, an environment that keeps th those people alive, but which is also very, or maybe very uh, uh, fragile as well. So there is a, a, a sense of captivity and also uh, loneliness uh, in it. Uh, but like I said, although it's known, what is the piece of music that Ron McNair should have recorded? I did not want to make happen what did not happen, but rather think of what in the existing pieces of music makes me think that it could be the soundtrack of an intention. Not the outcome of the recording, but the soundtrack of an intention. So what would be the soundtrack of Ron McNair's intention to record a piece in space? And I thought, after listening many different uh, 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 compositions, I thought the Quartet for the End of Times were the, the, the one that I felt intuitively the, 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 the bond between the two. Um, it's, a, it's a film which is entirely done in CGI, computer-generated imagery. It could perhaps have been done for real. Uh, it just has been extremely difficult and extremely, extremely uh, expensive. However, to me, it's very important how real it looks, not, not just how well one can fake reality, but reality brings also its challenges. And I think as an artist, I'm very... I cannot be creative without challenges. So how can you make challenges in CGI? Because in CGI, you may have technical challenges, but you have no challenges to what you want to achieve because you can do everything. It's like making a drawing on a piece of paper. More complicated than that, but still, there is nothing to tell you, oh, now the sun is moving and the light and it's too late and, and so on. Or the snail is not going further, it does not want to go further, etc. So there, uh, one of the things of how to produce uh, uh, limits to, 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 to that freedom was to make it as, as, as close as possible to reality. For example, put in all the data, put in, in the mathematical models of how, of the, uh, of how the turntable uh, moves, as much algorithms which are part of, of, of knowledge or public domain about the behavior of bodies in zero gravity. So there are certain mo so the mix is something between a real mathematical uh, model as well as, of course, moments of, uh, of uh, animation, meaning me as an artist, at that, that moment I want the stylus to stay longer to finish that particular phrase that I wanted to, to finish. So it's a negotiation between the two. 
And also, physically speaking, it's not one object, it's two objects which are uh, uh, rotating because you have the turntable, the body, but you also have the, the, the tone arm, the stylus, and they are not necessarily within, they are attached, so they depend on each other. Uh, the tone arm more so to the turntable, but still they have their own uh, cycles and, and revolutions. So the, the moment the touchdown, you can feel a, a floor um, um, downstairs because some then you feel like the, the, the wall is shivering, or that there's uh, enormous vibration, like a, with an earthquake, and this is the moment where the needle touches the turn. Exactly. exactly. For because uh, in zero gravity, if you, uh, what, is what is important is the first, the first push, spin you give to a body, and we see it often when we see uh, astronauts in space sometimes like, they move once like this and they can stay like that and they can go almost forever because there is very little friction to, to slow them down. So, for, but for me, for the composition and for what we wanted to achieve uh, with the music and the, uh, and the narration, so to say, I wanted the revolutions, the directions, all this to change. For this, you need another reason. So very often, uh, otherwise they would just, the stylus would do more or less the same orbit, so do the, the, the turntable. So very often, in order to give my, uh, the film a reason, a real reason is this moment of shakes, which is, uh, parts of debris uh, of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, in space that hits the station. And because it's, it shakes the station, of course, it shakes the, the, the turntable. And interrupts the, the sound. And interrupts the sound. And then it changes also the pace, the rhythm, the, the, the nervosity, so to say, of the, of the... And there is also, for example, another moment when the revolutions are always going in this way. And then there's a moment goes backwards just because the, 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 the electricity uh, cord of the, of, the, of the turntable has reached its maximum and then pushes it back. So all these are parts of the... Also, so to say, the, the, the algorithms or mathematical models to, to make it real. But I'm not saying this to say, oh, how sophisticated it is, but it's to say that uh, to me it was very important to, 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 to enact and to stage the, 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 the limits the, 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 to, uh, in order to create tension and to create uh, traction. Uh. Just the last phrase and last question. Uh, you made a difference between language and um, music. That was very interesting. I followed it in an interview upstairs. Maybe you can retell this. Yeah, I, I, um, one, one of my earliest pieces is Intervista, uh, which, which not only is with language and, and a, a lot about language and the role language plays in, in, in establishing hours and, and regimes, but it's also uh, 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 the film that made me aware of the opacity of language, which means that in my own work after that film, somehow I drifted towards silence and then sound and then music arrived. And I would say that um, uh, the difference between, in the way at least how I conceive and use it uh, uh, in my work, the difference between language and music is that the first one tells and the other one conveys. And the moment that you convey without telling, you allow for the subjectivity of the, of the other, of the, of the viewer. Uh, you are not sending a package. The, 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 the listener and the viewer could because of uh, maybe uh, uh, a lack of accentuation in the, in the clarity of the message can bring their own subjectivity. They can bring their own uh, 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 reading or understanding of feeling into the, into, into the work. And this idea works quite well with Peter Zumter's architecture. I, I think uh, this architecture, is, it's so, uh, in, in my feeling, when I've been visiting, it's so much about experience and, and so little about discourse. Uh, and discourse, like in all fields of culture, have become, has become extremely important, whether it's in art, in architecture, it's a, very, it's a shortcut to relate with, with, with people, with uh, visitors, with readers, with press, with... Uh, uh, and, and in that sense, I feel much closer to, to like I said, to conveying rather than telling, to, to experience more than, than discourse. And, and in that sense, uh, uh, one of the things that made me feel so, so intuitively at home with this building is, is, is that, what I call a, 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 
uh, the importance of focus on, on experience and less on, on this course. Um, despite the fact that this course is somehow foreign to this place, uh, we accept questions. Gibt es welche Fragen? Wenn nicht, dann uh, Andre. Many thanks for this um, this morning. And um, um, Sie haben sicher Gelegenheit, in, in, in Einzelgesprächen über die Details noch zu erfahren oder grund, grundsätzliche Intentionen. Und um, herzlichen herzlichen Dank. Many thanks to you. Thank you, Thomas. It was a great pleasure. Ich darf noch einige Dinge ankündigen. Natürlich unser Eröffnungstag uh, morgen, der um 15 Uhr startet und um 20 Uhr endet. Uh, Andri und ich werden noch mal sprechen am Samstag am Vormittag, wie üblich, uh, um 11 Uhr. Dann darf ich Sie noch daran erinnern, dass uh, das Sammlungsschaufenster, die Sammlung König Lepschig, auch diese Tage, wenn wir geschlossen haben, also heute, geöffnet ist. Uh, und uh, ab den uh, Festspielen schalten wir um auf die Sommeröffnungszeiten. Es wird auch also am Montag hier im Kunsthaus und im Sammlungsschaufenster geöffnet sein. Uh, an dem kleinen Counter da vorne kriegen Sie noch ein rotes Papierl, das erlaubt Ihnen ein Getränk im Cup Café gegenüber. Vielen herzlichen Dank. Thank you.